So welcome everyone. Today is Wednesday, July the 1st, 2020, and this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call. I'm Tricia Gordon at the University of Virginia facilitating our uh, call today. And um, I'd like to invite everyone to sign into Etherpad. I put the link in the chat. And uh, we're gonna get started first with some announcements. And I see, I think Wilma has already added some um, to our yep. Etherpad. That uh, was me. Um, so the first one is about the upcoming Sakai PMC and community meeting. That is scheduled for Friday, July 24th. And it's going to be kind of a four hour time block. Um, we're going to do the PMC stuff at the beginning and then we'll be having some sort of breakout discussions. We're going to try to make it kind of unconferency and let people suggest topics for discussion and be able to, to go into smaller breakout rooms to, um, to chat and then come back together as a, a big group to kind of report back on anything that came out of those discussions. So um, it's going to be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the 24th. I invite everyone to attend if you're interested, even if you can't make it for the whole thing. If you want to just drop in for part of it, that's totally fine. Um, it's going to be in Big Blue Button, Room 1. And um, there's a draft agenda, so if you have thoughts for things that you might want to bring to the PMC or um, to talk about with other community members at the community part of the meeting, um, please feel free to add them into that draft agenda between now and the 24th. Um, I also have some news on uh, target release dates. Um, for 20.1, there's, I think, um, one outstanding blocker that is being worked on right now. So we're targeting next week for the 20.1 maintenance release. So um, we have July 9th as kind of the, the tentative date, but it could be earlier than that if, if the blocker gets resolved before then. So, um, so hopefully that will be out very soon. Um, we're also hoping to get 20.2 out by August 1st. That's again, these dates can move, but that's our target. Mm -hmm. So we want to get that out by the beginning of August. And we're also projecting uh, a 19.5 release um, by the end of July. So those are the current um, dates that we're working with in terms of releases that are coming up in the next month or so. Fantastic. That's exciting. And then did I hear or read that um, there's a plan to freeze for Sakai 21 um, in September-ish? Yes, and actually we've talked about freezing even earlier. We've talked mm -hmm. about trying to freeze in August um, because usually with all the back to school stuff and you know people get really busy with local concerns in that late August, early September time frame, not a whole lot of new work gets done um, on features. So we're trying to see if we can shift the release pattern a little bit. And instead of releasing in like March or April, try to release in December or January so that there's, um, it's a more ideal time frame for people that want to, you know, test it out in the, and then upgrade in the summer. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're shooting for is to be able to freeze sometime in August, um, like mid mm -hmm. to late August. So, um, I don't cool. have an exact date, but right. that's, that's the thinking. Nice. That's all very exciting. Um, thank you, Wilma. Does anybody else have any, uh, announcements before we move on? Oh, Jennifer asked, what would the release date be for 21 if the freeze is in August? We're hoping we're hoping we could get the .o release out before the end of the calendar year. So in like December before people yeah. head off to vacation. Um, if not December, then early in January. Um, so we're, again, we're trying to back it up a few months to see if we can kind of shift our calendar a little bit and um, and then get on a better annual cycle so that it comes out, you know, at the end of the calendar year every year. Great. 
I pasted the wrong link to Etherpad, <clears throat> excuse me, in the um, chat. So let me try again. There you go. So anybody who hasn't yet signed in, please go on over there and do that. Um, okay, so we had a request from Laura Geckler to review a JIRA. And I'm going to paste this into the chat and also share my screen because I was watching some, <clears throat> excuse me, previously recorded sessions and uh, notice that we didn't always sh share the screen when we were talking about JIRAs. And, and um, so it's kind of a disconnected conversation if you're watching the recording. So let me... Try to choose a good window here to share. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go to. And then it's SAC 43859. And this is to do with modifying forum settings. Um, and that don't modify the associated old settings at the same time. So Laura Geckler, are you, let's see. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I was serving on the JIRA triage committee and uh, there were three of us. Uh, this was this was this Monday, yeah. And I knew I could get a fast turnaround from you guys. We really don't know how, how this should be, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how should we expect this to work? So the deal is that when you create forums, uh, they have a set of settings atta attached to them. And any topics underneath those, those fora uh, inherit those settings, right? So what the permissions are for the students and a whole bunch of other settings. Well, if you go back and edit the fora settings after the fact, um, the topic settings underneath it do not get modified. They instead keep the settings they had when they were originally created. And the question is, do we want it to work like that? Or do we want it to be changed so that if you change the Fora settings, they, are, they again trickle down to the topics underneath them? Did that make sense? I, I think it's extremely important to make it an option because if an instructor goes in and creates a, a forum that has 20 topics with different dates and they want to change one other setting uh, and they don't want the new date at the top level of the forum to trickle down into all of those, they should have a checkbox to do that. Um, you know, while they're changing the forum settings, there should be some kind of checkbox or radio button before you hit save that says, do you want to apply these new settings to all of the existing topics in this forum? Hmm. I agree. Because I don't want to go through and make a whole bunch of changes to all of my topic settings and then suddenly go back and change a forum setting and now my topics are all messed up and then I have to change each single one again individually. I mean, that's the whole problem right now is that it's not populating down uh, to previous topics. We don't want to have the reverse problem for people who have customized individual topics um, by forcing it to trickle down. Okay, let's hear from some others. I think, I think where we're going right now is that um, we, like in other places, we like the idea of being able to do a bulk edit. It's kind of reminding me of that, only it's the option to either trickle down the changes at the top or not trickle down. I had assumed that behavior would trickle down, you know, to all the existing topics if you're changing the forum settings. But if it's not doing that, then... It, it, could be, it could be a little tricky. I mean, is it going to copy all the changes or only the item that you changed? Like if you only change the mark messages as red option, um, maybe you don't want it to mess up your dates 
on the other ones, but you do want it to, to pick up that one change. So I think well, we've had to be real specific about what gets trickled down. Mm. Uh, so you're saying if if I created a forum that didn't have dates, then I created a to created topics that did have dates. Then I went back and changed the forum to allow mark for re or mark all as red. Right. You don't want it to overwrite your dates and null them out. Yeah, there's a lot of settings that it could override. Mm -hmm. And the permissions, the permission settings could cause yes. drastic problems too. Yes. So if you create topics automatically for groups and then you change some permission at the forum level, say you change your TA permissions at the forum level, that could overwrite all of the group settings and suddenly make them no longer release the group. Mm. Yeah, that could get messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe there should only be a specific set of things that you can change uh, as a trickle down, like that checkbox, something that would be something you'd want to apply universally. I don't know. Um, there are certain settings that you can't change at the forum level, but you can definitely change like access settings at the forum level that can be different at topic levels. Permission settings, for example. Why does it always turn out that something that sounds so simple and obvious, <laughs> just when you really start to look at it, just becomes so complicated? Oh, it's an <laughs> onion. It's got all these Wonderful. layers. <laughs> <laughs> and then it all falls apart in the TNL call. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why we have these discussions, right? Yes. Good discussion. So, Tiffany, your comment from a couple of days ago, just want to read that out loud. I agree that the option should be available to apply changes to existing topics in the forum as a checkbox or radio button to select before saving the forum settings. So, so you, so you change the forum settings. I guess instructors probably could very well not realize that changing it at the forum level is going to apply to all the topics in that forum and having you know so you check it and does the label for that checkbox need to change then to say this will only apply to new topics or you know what i'm saying well, well i wonder if you need a checkbox it like, couldn't it be a confirmation message like when you hit save you get a confirmation pop-up that says do you want to apply this change to the other items in this forum? And you either choose yes or no. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fine. Currently, it doesn't apply them to existing topics. So, you know, at all. So there's no trickle down whatsoever and there's no option for trickle down. And that has been a point of confusion a couple times with our instructors. Um, but, um, you know, the in this JIRA, the description also mentioned the importance of having it be optional to do that trickle down, you know, to apply it to existing ones versus, uh, you know, the current behavior. And I think you all have described a, plenty of use cases that indicate that that it, you know, there should be an option. It shouldn't just automatically apply it. Um, but I think the problem with confirmation is one of scope again, going back to one of the things that Wilma first identified. Are we talking about only the things which you change on the page that are going to cascade, or is it all the settings again? You almost need on a setting by setting basis whether or not you want that to cascade. Well, keep in mind that not all of the things that are in the topic settings can be changed in the forum settings. Right. So the dates at the forum level will not trickle down into topics because the dates set at the forum level are controlling all topics within that forum automatically. Um, that sounds like they do trickle down. Well, they don't trickle down by placing, inserting themselves into the topic. They they trickle down as an effect only. They govern. They, they are govern. Governing. Exactly. They're so the way the forum settings work is they're kind of like a template. Um, with certain uh, governing principles like, uh, you know, the, its date controls everything within it. Its lock controls everything within it. 
<clears throat> this sounds like just maybe, maybe we should have eye. that op option at the topic level then because it's completely misreading misleading sorry to have it at the form level and other be other options when they're changed at the form level do affect the existing topics i assume and well, at the form always... level, it is like a template, though. So if you know you're going to make a bunch of topics and you want them all to be marked as red, then mm. doing it at the forum level saves you time because you don't have to do that each time mm -hmm. you do a new topic. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, it is a template. It's not like a – the dates are the only thing that affect all topics within the forum like post post existence you can set a closed date on the on the forum and then all the topics in it are affected because the forum disappears or appears as the case may be based on its dates so uh can we wrap this up since we have a lot of remaining agenda to go through do we have a clear agreement on how we want this behavior to work. Um, here's a proposal, and I want to see if this gets any traction. Um, when you are in forums, you have the ability to create new topic forum settings, and then there is a more dropdown. In lieu of modifying forum settings with a cascade option, would there be an option to add something to the more dropdown for modify topics? And in that UI, you could have whatever settings could apply to all topics below the forum in order to batch edit all topics. Hmm. I mean, I'd, I'd prefer some kind of bulk edit screen where I could just like set the settings and check the boxes for the topics I want them to apply to and do that in, in the more or whatever. Um. So the forum settings establishes the template. The more menu allows you to do batch editing. I don't know if I'd want it under the more menu. Hmm. Um, I, I like the bulk edit option because sometimes you do want to change a whole bunch of things at once. But I, I kind of feel like it almost needs its own tab. So I you agree. could do, yeah, so you could do all forums and all topics at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. It should be called batch edit <laughs> or yeah, something like exactly. bulk edit. Yeah. Bulk edit. Bulk edit. Yeah. I think they're called bulk edit and other tools. Oh, bulk edit. Okay. Yeah. Bulk. Um, is that going to satisfy the, the behavior changes that we want for this JIRA? Can somebody capture that as a comment? Yeah, you better run it by me again. I'm trying to type it up and realized I didn't understand well what was going on. Um, <laughs> Laura, because, so, there, sorry, go ahead. because there's ambiguity when editing a topic regarding which settings could cascade and which couldn't, the topic settings or forum settings establish a template for subsequent topics that you create but there should be a separate menu for batch edit to bulk allow edit. you we're going to call it bulk edit right to edit groups of items so there's behavior for creating a template in uh, creating a forum in the first place in the first place. Uh, uh, sets a template by which the subsequent topics or from which from which the subsequent topics derive their settings. But editing a forum, 
What does that do? It, that that would just change for, the template for any new topics that are created. But it would not trickle down to existing it topics. Changes the template for new topics does not aid or overwrite overwrite existing topics. New screen. <clears throat> Bulk edit. Mm -hmm. Contains a list of settings with checkboxes which can be applied to existing topics. Up there? That, I think that captures it. I, I can already imagine scenarios where that bulk edit could be problematic, but I'm not going to talk about this more right now. <laughs> All right, so that. I will open this JIRA. Um, hmm. I think maybe we need some design work on this too. Is that currently the label UI or UX? Oh. UX. UX, thank you. All right, thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yeah, I think this uh, would warrant some um, doing of mock-ups and, uh, and consideration of what all we'd want to apply in bulk edit potentially and, and the issues that could arise from it. Oops. Oh, for heaven's sakes. OK, am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm opening up this um, discussion document from Open Ontario for Design, Design Resilience because we're going to move on to our main topic. Um, so this is just a guideline, really. I'm I'm thinking that we want to really have a conversation around what we're doing for fall. Um, it's, I think it's on everybody's minds. People are, you know, planning <laughs> resources and developing resources to help faculty with the, probably a lot of us, most of us, perhaps all of us are, um, now going to have students back on campus, but also remote. So there's going to be a hybrid, uh, situation for instructors and um so laura sira um suggested we have a conversation around you know what we did in the spring but also looking at what we're doing for fall that from so just opening it up for whatever folks want to share or questions you want to ask hi trisha or, yeah it's jolie how are you? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm the interloper here on this uh, <laughs> on this Never. call today. <laughs> um, I'm I'm lurking because um, Lucy and I sort of facilitated this discussion last week with Michael, and um, I would love. I know I think it's great that everybody's just sort of sharing what they're doing. Um, I would love to have an outcome um, for just the community in terms of um, thinking about what we might be able to contribute to the resilience network. Um, so just kind of keep that as an idea um, as we talk about this, if there are any kind of themes across our group that might look like something like that. Um, you know, what, what could our contribution look like to his resilience network um, resources? We may not have, we may not come up with anything, but if we can identify, um, you know, any kind of contribution there, that would be fantastic. Cool. 
yeah, I'm not sure if we will or not, but yeah, that is a, a good goal. So at the beginning of this process, um, as we were just kind of clicking into the meeting today, we were kind of having a side conversation. And now that Laura Geckler is here, we can add in, but um, she is mostly involved in a, an initiation that I guess the provost office brought to uh, the OIT, right, Laura? Um, I don't remember the, the birth of this, but anyway, the project involves creating a course site in Sakai that we will be feeding all faculty, staff, and students through for kind of an overview of training on what it's going to, what's expected of them as community members as they start to return to campus. Yeah, uh, when we had the conversation at Open Aperio, we discovered that um, I think Pepperdine has some faculty training that was in response to quickly bringing faculty who don't usually teach online to online and conducting that training online in Sakai. It was uh, such a sweet idea. I asked Alan at the time if that could be made available to the Sakai community. And I don't think I received an answer back on that. So that was one where the, the, you know, the teaching and learning people, I think that was a good, a good thing that they, they had happened during the beginning of the pandemic that could be recyclable as we continue to train faculty about how to teach online. And then the, the current initiative at Notre Dame is really how our campuses have changed since the last time our students were on campus and often the last time some of the faculty and staff were on campus. And so how do you orient all of those people to, to the kinds of behaviors and responsibility that a campus has to take for each other's health? And, and so that's the kind of initiative I'm involved in right now. I'm happy to say that as a result of the spring attention to fully online learning, a lot more people have become aware of the learning management system. And it's funny how <laughs> many people want to do training um, and think, huh, you mean we have a system on campus that will facilitate learning? And it just shocks me when, when these conversations happen. Like, well, actually, yes, we do. Well, Laura, to be fair, we have a very high adoption rating rate rate or or of Sakai on campus. Especially it's just now. that. Well, no, I mean prior to prior to all this, but as you pointed out, um, and as everybody points out every year as we go through Open Imperio and have countless um, presentations on Just lost your audio. Laura. How do you engage you faculty? Go. Am I back? Yes, you're back now. Sorry. Okay, um, being in what, 15 years in this business, faculty are incentivized. And, and to Laura's point, they knew that we had an LMS, but they saw it as a repository. Laura, I think we lost you again. Yeah, something wonky's going on there. For Oh, she just dropped. Hopefully she'll come back and have a better signal. Um, so the project that we're doing right now is is kind of based off of the new it was coronavirus.nd.edu. I just hated that for the for the <laughs> the link. Now it's called here.nd.edu and there's actually a full um, campaign, if you will, with signage and and training. And that is also being placed inside Sakai 
as Laura mentioned, we will be running faculty, staff, and students, everybody, all 20,000 folks, um, through a site in Sakai to give them their initial level of training for what will be expected of them when they come back to campus. And then we'll just give them, a, at when they're finished, um, a link to more information where, you know, the site that, that the uh, health and safety folks will be updating more daily. But, you know, lessons pages, um, required elements, maybe automatic check marks in a list somewhere that, that checks off completion of some of these things. Um, more information as mm -hmm. it develops <laughs> rapidly. In right. the next weeks. Interesting. So how do you guys envision getting these people through the site? Do you expect to do cohorts or um, just self-serve or? This is the amazing thing that uh, hopefully Laura can fill in with, but um, it's act, there's actually, they're actually going to be registered in the site. Um, all these people, I mean, of course, everybody with a net ID, which is what we call our user ID at Notre Dame, everyone has access to Sakai and can use it. Um, but she's working out something so that uh, with the rest of the folks in the OIT, so that these folks are registered automatically in this site. So it won't be a joinable site. It won't be something they have to look for as a public site. Uh, here's Laura back again. Hopefully she can explain how she's getting that set up to get folks registered in this site automatically. Hey, Laura, were you able to get your yeah. audio back? Yeah. Great. So uh, Laura, Sarah filled us in a little bit that this site you're working on developing is, is going to be mandatory for all faculty, staff, and students. And we were just asking how they will, you know, use the site. Will they, and Laura told us they would be automatically registered, so they'll automatically have access. But my question is, are, you know, how are they going to be directed through the site? And is it um, just a, a, a self-service kind of, you go through it, you complete certain things and, and, and there are features built in to track that? That's a question. Oh, Laura, I think we've lost you again. I don't know. She may have to type her response. <laughs> you there, Laura Geckler? Oh. <laughs> she can't hear Trisha. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Am I back? You're back yeah. there right now. Quick answer the question. <laughs> For the moment. How weird. Well, the topic <laughs> the topic under discussion was uh, was a resiliency network, right? Um, is, isn't that the topic? I mean, this is only part of it, and this is kind of ongoing how we how we can go into the fall. Um, I think the faculty yeah. aspect of, so there's two aspects of, of going into the fall. One of them is how, how do we communicate to our campus? And I think you could use Sakai or not use Sakai um, as to, what kinds of things people have to learn. And to your point, Tricia, we're, we're doing this quite passively. This is not an instructor-led sort of thing. This is a walk-through content, so lessons that are prerequisites. So you go one through another through another and, and um, videos and paragraphs to read and um, maybe the single question feature in lessons or a test and quiz, rename the gradebook into progress and, you know, voila, you you can do it. the The biggest thing, as as we fellow LMS admins know, is the volume that you're going to put through this. So our campus, um, we're going to try a site with um, well, well, it's going to be a site with almost twenty thousand people in it. I'll just give you a warning about that. Something we learned. Um, we had a site where we were adding all of our instructors who created course sites, um, you know, because we would get the official course site creation notices. So we knew who they were. And we'd add them to the site and we were using it for communications. And that fell apart after we 
maxed out on I don't know what, but communications out of that site stopped working. So the communication stopped working. It was announcements. The announcements tool, when you send email uh, with announcements, will only allow it to send to a certain number of recipients. I don't remember mm -hmm. how many hundred that was. We had to break them up into multiple groups and then yeah. like resend the same announcement to each group. And hope that we got them off. It was became a nightmare. So just an FYI about that. Did you uh, have the user press presence tool? disabled yeah. as well that's something that we're well, we finding out. Disabled. yeah we have we've never enabled we've always okay. had it disabled but um well i'm getting rid of the announcement tool now <laughs> well you can you can use it you just can't use it to send emails to them i mean if you're just going to use it as the announcements tool on the site and they can access those announcements that's fine well right. there's no difference between that and email archive you know why, why use them both? So any mass notifications that are meant to go as an email probably will break it. it yeah, I, I, that has been our experience. So just a heads up about that. And exactly, Jolie, I was just going to say that sometimes your IT department doesn't allow us, you know, beyond a certain number. You know, at some point, I don't know if, you know, for our department, if you have over a thousand recipients, that's considered mass mail and you have to use a different process to communicate with those folks. So we've actually switched to using MailChimp to communicate with our instructors using our Sakai. Um, so thank you. Um, what are others doing in preparation for fall? And I, you know, I'm I, I, I think the you know orientation for everyone is super important. But I think um, you know around teaching and learning, it's such a challenge to do hybrid courses. And so I'm wondering um, what what folks are working on. I'll, I'll jump in. <clears throat> so. We have, so scuttlebutt is that we are also going to be having some kind of overall employee, um, I guess you could call it return orientation um, that everybody's going to have to, to do. I think they're even going to make it mandatory. Um, but that is not going to be through our Sakai instance. That's, that's going to be through some other platform that they've been using for some other training things. Um, they can probably handle the, the large numbers that they're thinking about. Um, however, we do have uh, a Sakai site that we call Online Teaching Mentors that we set up. We actually initially set it up in the spring um, to, uh, and we recruited a number of faculty, experienced online teaching faculty to serve as mentors and help answer at least some of the pedagogical questions that we knew were coming in um, and we knew we'd be overwhelmed um, when we made our switch from um, face to face to online and we've just continued that and we have now um, added to that with a whole DIY online teaching um, set of modules for people they and they can work through it um, either completely on their own there are also some accompanying face-to-face -face workshops some of which are also being conducted by our our faculty mentors um, there is also um, a certificate plan where if you go through these things you can earn a, earn a, earn a certificate um, that you can include in and that they can include in their promotion, tenure, annual review um, materials. And this has been pretty heavily supported by the provost's office. So it's got some, some um, what's the word I'm looking for, oomph behind it. Um, so that's something that we've done. That's awesome. 
Yeah, as Laura points out, supported by the provost office is the gravitas it needs. And, I, you know, I, I wish I could say I knew at UVA if if the provost office was incentivizing any of this for faculty. I just, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't heard that they are and they haven't in the past. So it's even more challenging. We need some background noise from somebody. Let me turn that off. The uh, there is vacuuming going on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about others? Anyone else um, have? Um, so, Jolie just asked: Is anyone thinking about how to make resources created in response to COVID as evergreen resources? I expect that our material will probably. Um, stay available into the future, um, at least into the foreseeable future. Uh, we'll probably try and keep updating it, but um, I don't I don't see it going away. Yeah, Laura's been actually going through our online Zoom workshops uh, that we put into Panopto, and she's been breaking them down into chapters, and of course they have transcriptions that go with them so that we actually can provide them to faculty who might have missed some of these conversations, because these are workshops that are general in some cases, you know, tests and quizzes, how to go through, set up your tests and quizzes, how, how to make your goals for teaching fit into Sakai, that sort of thing. So um, that's definitely something that we're working on, because we don't really want to have to do a Zoom session on all these workshops, you know, every other week. It'd be great if we could just make a really good one and print it. Yeah. And uh, and make it very usable for folks so they don't have to sit through a, a 45 minute presentation but can skip around. Yes. Tiffany did something similar for us. She, she did a couple of several workshops and recorded them. And then she created a site in our Sakai um, that anyone who has logged in can access to to view those recordings. And the reason we're doing it that way is because um, she included some actual fact, you know, instructor um, sites and didn't want to just make it publicly available. So just UVA folks. Um, and also one of the things that we're working on is identifying instructors who not to serve as mentors, per se, as you're doing Charles at Illinois State, but um, to perhaps record or have a demo that we record, a little session where they talk about a feature that you're, they're using and, and have had good success with. Because one of the things we, we've recognized for a while is that faculty like to see what other faculty are doing. They don't really want to hear us talk about how to use a particular tool, but they would love to see what other faculty are doing for inspiration. Um, so, so that's something that, that we're going, we're working on right now. And um, uh, it, you know, it's my hope that we will have these as evergreen resources for our faculty, because it's, it's just a great way to inspire others on what's possible. You know, some some instructors are doing some really cool things and nobody knows that that it's even possible. So. Um, we think that'll be pretty, pretty um, interesting for our faculty. Yes, via Zoom. Yeah, great idea, Laura. Laura says we are organizing a faculty discussion on what they learned during spring online teaching via Zoom. Yeah, that's great. Others. Tiffany, Tiffany, do you have anything to add to what I was describing? Um, no, I mean, I think uh, the main thing is trying to get uh, faculty interested in, um, in using the tools and using the right tools. Um, so for example, you know, the right question types and tests and quizzes, like don't put your uh, multiple choice question as a 
uh, short answer essay question, actually make it a multiple choice question. <laughs> That's something I worked with uh, about three or four faculty on in the past few weeks was changing their questions to the actual correct question types <laughs> that they had been manually grading for five semesters. <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> yes. Oh my. Yes. Um, so, you know, just sort of um, trying to find a way to uh, get folks to um, to attend uh, sessions and, and work with them. Um, you know, it's really, I found it really helpful uh, after working with some instructors to have that sort of uh, faculty word of mouth. Um, I was working with some nursing instructors a couple of semesters ago, and uh, and they uh, they both said I worked with two instructors, and they both said, you know, this was really great. Uh, I wish you know I had known about this years before, you know, that I could have come and worked with you guys. And so I said, you know what, I why don't I reach out to nursing and ask them um, about doing some kind of demos or like an office hours type of thing for them. And I found that to be very successful because these faculty members went to their colleagues and said, hey, go check this out because I made something really cool after, you know, going and um, and working with uh, with Collab Support. So. Yeah, that's that's great. See, they, they really listen to other their colleagues more than they they will listen to us. So Jolie has asked templates in Sakai as a question. And Charles, do you want to go ahead and say your response out loud? If I can remember to unmute myself, sure. Um, so yeah, we have a set of four templates that one of our people has created. They're, they're kind of structured differently, um, mostly using lessons pages. So, you know, one's set up to be, you know, one, one page for every week. There's others that are set up as, you know, I forget exactly what they are. Um, since I didn't make them, I, I'm not completely familiar with them, but I know they're out there. Um, that a faculty can fill out a form and say, I'd like to have template number two put into my, um, bio 101 course for fall and then we have a couple graduate assistants that are actually handling these requests where they'll go in and and import that template into um, the fall course site um, and then if if they're going to be teaching in the spring and they're really thinking ahead um, we'll set up a sandbox for them that they can work in first um, and and you know just duplicate the template for their sand, sandbox course um, so we have those as well um, I could actually, you know what, I wonder um, if you give me a minute, I will go find the, the page and put a link in like somebody else just did. Yeah, Jolie pasted a, a link um, to Let's see. a document with um, some of their site template resources. That is super, Jolie, thank you. And at UVA, we also use site templates. Um, we make them available. Our instructors don't always use them, but um, Regina course templates. There it is. So this is actually part of our. Well, it's it's also linked from our. It's called Redbirds Keep Teaching. Um, that got set up in the spring with all of the the information about um, whatever is going on and, and the most recent updates. Um, this is aside from what's inside our um, the Sakai site, um, the online um, mentors site. Our Regina keeps teaching is um, just more general information about various things. Yeah. Nice. That's that's great, Charles. We only have a couple. Um, since I'm the only Duke person on the call today, I think I can speak to that. Um, when Tiffany brought that up during the uh, resilience network discussion, it's getting very uh, inception over there on the in the uh, <laughs> in the screen share. Um, Sorry. I realized we're all doing that, right? We're all creating templates and it'd be interesting to see what other people are doing. We just have, in addition to the default template that we've had for a long time, um, we've included 
a minimal template and an advanced template. So we just have three. And one of them is the same one that we've been using for years. Nice. ReggieNet doesn't seem to fix the ugly template stuff, the checklist. Mm, what are you looking I'm not at? Not sure what you mean. You'll want you'll want a default uh, C CSS as well that changes some of that crud. Yeah. So, for example, the checklist background and the question background uh -huh. are are just horrible colors. Uh, so yeah. your default CSS needs to include something like, here's my big blue button chat here. So just uh, change the div content column, change the background color. That is a teal color. That's like a tertiary color at Notre Dame, but mm -hmm. with with ReggieNet. Um, It'd probably be pink. Ew. <laughs> pink and <Wow>. red. <laughs> well, you could make the background the red color and change the text to white. Mm. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of striking. Yeah, probably just a light gray would be better than having them read a lot of text in white. Or anyway. the dark the dark gray that you have at the top of ReggieNet with a, a lighter gray text or white text. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the opportunity here for revision is endless, Charles. Get out your color wheel. <laughs> Jen Bethman will get on our case if we don't uh, do it right, so. Any other quick um, shares or questions? We have just a few minutes left. In template, uh, in template two, they've changed the background color to a gray. That looks nice. Oh, that's interesting that it's changed in temp that they're different. Jolie just shared uh, some screenshots of their template. Thank you, Jolie. Awesome. I was wondering, um, Laura, since you mentioned um, changing the default CSS in lessons, do you have multiple default CSSs that people can like automatically select from your um, lessons page? Like, you know, let's say I wanted to have a blue um, yeah, no. styled versus a red style or something like that. No, I don't. I had Longsight put a default on the server for every, for, you know, what it sets right. up with. And then right. we have a knowledge base article where I've put a default template with a lot of stuff that isn't active, but so that they could edit them, edit it themselves. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I was interested in, um, uh, having, like, because I know in that drop down, once you've uploaded something to resources, it comes up in that list of like different CSS files that you can choose from. But I'd be interested in having them just available for the instructors to select so they don't have to upload it first. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was curious if, if you guys had found a way to do that to make it just available, not visible in resources everywhere. Um, Charles has posted a question to you, Laura, or a statement. I'll have to check into that in version 20 and see about making the change going forward with the style sheet. So cool. Good suggestion about that because not all of the defaults are really, they could all, or many of them could, could use a little design love. Yeah, I think there's a um, couple of JIRAs in that, you know, we need to consider in 21. Yeah. Uh, so that so that the colors out of the box are manageable in a couple, only a couple different places and not everywhere so that you can change them to your branding. Yeah, and Jolie has shared another um, resource 
link. Uh, I'm not sure what's, oh, it's a presentation. So a tool they built in kits to show faculty location and network bandwidth of their students. Oh my gosh, that is so cool, Jolie. Thanks. Um, it's kind of outside of the scope of Sakai. I know it's something that we built in kits, but it is totally something you could steal as an idea. Oh my, that is, that is um, so helpful because... Yeah. We, we deployed that back in the spring. Our um, Office of Student Affairs worked with OIT, and because it was delivered through my platform, I got involved. Um, it was basically just like survey all the students, get their data, uh, then pull that data into an app that we display at the course level. Um, so we were actually directing faculty to kits to be able to view that data, because it's not necessarily something you have to check all the time. It's something you can check early on in your planning for your course, make some decisions about yeah. the possibilities of synchronous, asynchronous, what kind of tools you can use. Wow. Um, so, yeah. That is so cool. Oh my goodness. Thanks. I can't wait to share that. Um, thank you everyone for your wonderful ideas and this discussion. It's, it's so good to be sharing our work and our um, good ideas with each other. We are at the top of the next hour, so I'm sure many of you have other meetings or at least other work to do. Just a reminder that our next meeting is on July 15th. Uh, Laura Geckler and Josh Wilson will be talking about release management and how much change faculty can handle. And then we have some co couple of open dates in August, so uh, we'll be looking to schedule some topics. Um, thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you soon, I hope. Thanks. Thanks all.